and greetings to everybody else again. Okay. Yeah, Lessa, you'll be happy to know that around 200 people have already joined us. And that number, uh, I can assure you, will go above 250. So, uh, and people are, uh, these participants, uh, this is, uh, your lecture is lecture number eight. Most of these participants are very regular. They have been joining us right from lecture one. And this lecture series, Gnosis, you might know Lessa, is an international general, which is a print general, which is uh, run by me and my team. And this general's uh, series uh, will continue till around 10th, 10th of June, where we have asked, uh, uh, you know, researchers uh, doing research on a particular field to come and share their research with us. And, uh, you know, uh, our main motto of uh, this lecture series is where you share your research with us. We as academicians, because most of us participants here are academicians, we as academicians, some of us might be interested after your le lecture to explore your area. So what we'll do is we will explore and then we will encourage our researchers, our MPhil and PhD students to, you know, uh, carry on the research on your particular field. So that is the main objective of NOSIS lecture series. And this lecture series, after the series is over, these videos will be uploaded uh, with a copyright that if an idea also is shared from your lecture, uh, we request as per the uh, you know publication ethics we request our researchers to give you due credit so that is the motive of nosis yes. uh, we started from 17th of may and this lecture series will continue at least till 10th of june uh, we have engaged and included uh, participants uh, you know researchers from around the world uh, uh, you know and they have, they have been very kind enough like you to spare the valuable time with us and share the uh, field of uh, research. So without wasting much time, I'd just like to uh, give a brief introduction of uh, Lahesa, who, who has been very kind right from the day I have contacted him. And uh, Lahesa is basically a lecturer in the, uh, in the lecturer of department, uh, development studies in the University of South Africa. And he holds a master's degree in development of studies. Uh, and he is presently working on his doctoral studies under the topic towards an Afrocentric development paradigm in Africa. As I, uh, before Lessa has, uh, had joined us, I, to, I shared uh, my dear participants that uh, Lessa is doing extensive work on this particular topic, which he'll be sharing with us. And I have shared the abstract also with you, dear participants. This topic is a very, very interesting one. And uh, because we also were a country of colonization, we suffered the brunt of colonization for 300 years. Uh, for British colonization around uh, 300 years to uh, 250 years. So we understand and uh, African literature being one of the most prominent papers which is taught in India and Indian subcontinent. Uh, we understand the value of African researchers. We regard and honor the African writers. And uh, here we have an African, uh, you know, uh, upcoming, very budding and promising scholar with us. Uh, what more one can ask for? So Lessa, the platform is all yours. Thank you very much for, on behalf of Team Gnosis, thank you very much for joining us. It is a sheer honor for all of you, for, for all of us. Greetings from India. Over to you, Lessa. Thank you very much. And uh, it is still the early afternoon in South Africa. And I think uh, it is exactly one minute past two. And um, what a blessing it is indeed. And I want to thank Dr. Sian Day whom the journey that we have traveled through decolonial reflections on the social media has somehow enabled our energies to interact for the greater cause of challenging and changing the world. And I'm very much excited that it has basically led to this uh, uh, opportunity and I must say that among the participants, I'm able to acknowledge my dear brother and fellow colleague and my neighbor, soon to be Dr. Eddie Plaki. I can see him and thank you very much. And, and, and also uh, fellow sisters and brothers in the struggle. And, um, and I'm quite excited with that. And without any waste of time, I'm definitely going to be doing an honor of uh, getting onto the table and feasting along with you into this uh, uh, reflections. So in a way, as the topic had been already uh, introduced uh, on the title, 
debunking the hegemony of Eurocentric particularism and recentering African epistemologies. And I'm offering my the Afrocentric uh, critique. I think it is the most noble thing um, as I started this talk so that I frame a clear background of where I am coming from and I, how I got to be reflecting on such issues. Uh, first of all, I'm basically quite grateful for the scholarly contributions in my life um, of the two main scholars that have really played a role in terms of shaping my current academic engagement. Professor Sabelo Ndrovu Kacheni, who is one of the renowned uh, decolonial scholars in Africa, who also happened to become my supervisor for my current almost complete doctoral thesis. I'm quite actually uh, grateful for the work that he has done in my life. And also Professor Mulifikete Asante, who has really been my hero uh, and a shining light, whose work has shaped and has really challenged my worldview and my outlook. The beautiful thing is that both of them, I've had a privilege of sitting down with them face to face in terms of engagement. And I've also looked at how they have conducted their own lives beyond the scholarly reflections. And I'll forever be quite grateful for them as I take uh, this ball into the future. Now I'm getting down to what I'm here to do. Um, debunking the hegemony of Eurocentric particularism and recentering African epistemologies. Um, as part of an outline of my own uh, uh, paper, I had thought that it would be more noble to subdivide my presentation into the three sections so that it is more biteable you can be able to chew on it. Uh, the first point that I'm going to cover is to look at the interrogation of the falsity of Eurocentric epistemic arrogance that is embedded in the social sciences in order to unmask the contextual terrain of epistemological entrapment itself within which we find ourselves those who are within the global south. And then what fundamentally in that section I will look at is to respond to the question, what fundamentally is Eurocentrism? And how has it shaped our lives and epistemological outlook in our understanding of the world? Secondly, um, I will then use the field of development studies as my case in point. Having lectured and worked in this field uh, for many years now, um, I'm actually quite excited that I will prefer and be much more comfortable in reflecting on this as a case study. And the critical question I will reflect on is whose idea of development dominates the thinking about what development actually means. And then the last, which is the third point that I will actually cover, um, I will outline my ideological framework for the decolonization of the social sciences in Africa, in particular, the notion of societal development as embedded within the development studies itself. And I think, uh, you know, as a culture of academicians, conceptual clarification is very important. Uh, it is often very dangerous to start using concepts, having not defined them. In the process, we get lost in translation. So it is very crucial that uh, I begin with uh, providing an, an, an understanding 
and definition and clarity on the concepts that I'm using. What is epistemological entrapment? Uh, in the words of Professor Sabelo Ndrovukajeli, he uses the concept of entrapment to capture a paradoxical situation of involvement and marginalization of the global South as a construct of modern world system, modern world order, modern knowledge economy, and modern world economy itself. Entrapment, therefore, captures the complex imperial and colonial processes and practices that are used to drag the global south into the evolving nexus of the modern world system, of the global order, of the knowledge economy itself and the economic system, in accordance with the imperial and the colonial imperatives. Entrapment, therefore, describes the envisioned position within which the global south occupies, which means an insider who has been pushed to the outside to inhabit the invented periphery that is both inside and outside simultaneously, which could therefore means that we are part of the modern world system, but yet we are also the periphery informed by the logic of Europe as the center that invented itself. Of course, we all know the narrative that from 1492, the rise of modern Europe, if you look at the works um, of uh, Enrique Dusser, um, he, he actually clearly stipulates that, uh, uh, you know, 1492 become the apex moment within which uh, Europe becomes a unit that ventures outside of itself to invade other territories, which from their point of view, they claimed or they used the nomenclature, the new world. Of course, it was new from their point of view, but it is not as though that it was an, a barren land that was not occupied by people. And later on, we'll look at how the very same European scholars themselves using their racist nomenclature to describe the people who occupied this supposedly new world as the subhuman savages and barbarians without history and culture. That's how we evolved and better the journey into the history uh, that has actually shaped our identities has been. Um, the European particular knowledge has thus been used falsely as a standard and the overarching canon of thought to frame the understanding of the world, thus submerging and marginalizing other perspectives. And it perhaps becomes very important having dealt with the question of what epistemological entrapment means that we look at another concept which will dominate our conversations which is eurocentrism what fundamentally is eurocentrism such that i call it eurocentric particularism once we deal with the understanding of that concept then we will understand the significance of debunking it, those of us who are non-Europeans. According to Joseph, to, jo to George Joseph, Vasoretti, and Mary Chatterjee, um, Eurocentrism, it is the tendency to view one's own ethnic group and its social standards as a basis for evaluating judgments concerning the practices of others, with the implication that one's own standards are superior. And um, it is the deliberate distortion of the consciousness and the self-knowledge of humanity by the insistence of the people of European descent that all valid universal scientific knowledge economic progress, political structures, 
and works of art flow only from their ancestors. That is according to Useli and Uneli. And um, it is important to understand the contributions or the influences of what Eurocentrism has caused. Eurocentrism has contributed to epistemicides, which is uh, knowledge wars, theft of history, cultural imperialism, colonization of the mind and invasion of the mental universe of others, mental dislocation and alienation, psychological cloning of the natives by seeking to replace their memory, which would be their software, and download into them the software of European memory through the colonial education systems. For example, I can quote Fanon, speaking from the revolutionary struggle in Algeria. Um, Fanon, speaking from the revolutionary struggle in Algeria, states that European colonization is not simply satisfied with holding the natives in its creep and emptying the brains of all forms of contents. Rather, what it does, which is the most manifestation of evil, it turns into the past of the natives and then it distorts, it disfigures and destroys the memory. You see how evil that is. If your parents had taught you your name that you are Lehasa, what Eurocentrism comes, it, that it teaches you that you are Richard. So you began to dwell on two identities. One which is originally born from your own parents, one becomes an imputed false identity that serves their own. Uh, what the African regime had done, you know, they've been calling people names such as Jan, you know, Bobby, Bobby Jan, as a manifestation of the fact that they could not be able to understand the names of the locals. One of the interesting examples that we find through colonial education in South Africa, Bantu colonial education, it teaches the arrival of John van Riebeck in 1652 at the expense of the history of African people who had already occupied the land as though the history of the southern tip of Africa begins in 1652. So in a way, they have expressed obsession with themselves to the exclusion of others. In this way, the Eurocentric narrative of human progress is a key ideology underpinning white supremacy. It serves the function of legitimizing Euro-North American domination by claiming that it advances the best interest of all humanity. When necessary, this belief in Euro-North American cultural superiority is reinforced by a brute force to demand obedience to its object. For this reason, you know, it's my view that the discourse of modernity and enlightenment, it is in fact a violent and insensitive project that presents itself as God ordained, when actually it is a manifestation of evil against others. Thus, in the words of Amos Isai, in his book titled The Discourse on Colonialism, published in 1955, Eurocentric chauvinism advances nothing but civilization of death. Civilization that uses trickery and deceit. And it's a dying civilization. That is the expression of Amos Isai. It is incapable of solving the very problems that it has actually created. For this reason, in the words of Sisse, Europe is unable to justify itself before the bar of reason. It takes refuge in hypocrisy. 
Europe is morally and spiritually indefensible. All it has done is to leave the corpses everywhere. Shall I mention the war of America on Iraq, on Afghanistan, on Libya? The idea of the weapon, of the, the weapons of mass destruction founded upon the narrative of a lie. Patrick Chabal announces in his book entitled End of the Conceit for such a civilization. And interesting enough, the colonized themselves know that their self-imposed masters are weak and are lying. We have witnessed that they created the international criminal court justice systems to only use them to judge leaders of the non-European countries or counterparts. Maybe the critical question that remains in the minds of those in the global south is whether will one day Bush and Blair be able to be taken to the international criminal court system itself. Well, this is but just one of the expression of the hypocrisy that we see with the system itself. Now, having laid down this kind of a background coming to the social sciences, Mahmoud Mamdani in his reflection on Africa's post-colonial sketch raises the following critical questions with regard to the social sciences. And I'm excited that as educators, as researchers, uh, as those who profess, we would need to do a deep introspection as to the contents of what it is that which we actually are professing. Mamdani raises the following critical questions with regard to the social sciences. What does it mean to teach humanities and social sciences in a location where the dominant intellectual paradigm is a product not of Africa's own experience, but of a particular Western experience. And perhaps also my counterparts who are in India would need to also ask that question. What does it mean to teach the social sciences from that kind of a paradigm? In fact, maybe the critical question that we should all be asking is whose idea of the social and the sciences is embedded in the social sciences themselves? The second question that is raised by Mangani is how do we teach social sciences where dominant paradigms theorize a specific Western history and are concerned in a large part to extol the virtues of enlightenment. And the third point, and how do we teach social sciences? Where as a result, when these theories rooted in Western experiences expand to other parts of the world, they do so mainly by submerging particular origins and specific concerns through describing this in the universal terms of scientific objectivity. How do we take unique particular experiences that happens within the geographic context of the Western countries and use them as a standard model that should govern how the rest of the globe should think? This is a, it's a self-inflation, self-magnification, self-enlargement becoming larger than life. It is unthinkable that you can have perspectives that speaks from God's eye view, that uses concepts such as omnipresence, you know, omniscient. We are confined to the dictates of time and space. But we are surprised that Europeans see everything, know everything as do others don't exist. And I want to challenge those 
who are my fellow brothers and sisters in India and everywhere in the global south, to begin to ask these questions, to begin to interrogate the very foundations of the things that we are actually learning. According to Joseph, George Joseph Vasuredi and Mary Chatterjee, the persistence of Eurocentrism has had the following effects. It has damaged the non-European societies through the colonization of their intellectual frames. It has impoverished the academic disciplines themselves, which remain unaware of alternative sources of knowledge outside the mainstream development. It functions regardless of intention to legitimize international systems of inequality. Therefore, in Mamdana's view, the fundamental problem is not to read the so-called enlightenment task. But the problem is this, if enlightenment is said to be an exclusively European phenomenon, then the story of enlightenment is the one that excludes Africa, India, South Europe, Asia, and the rest of all other countries within the global south. Can it be that we who are then on the darker side of this enlightenment and modernity project, in particular, the objectified, that we adopt this Eurocentric mantras as a foundation on which to build the tertiary education in the global south or in Africa, in particular, the social sciences. Should that be the foundation? Where are our own experiences? Where are our own cultural frameworks? To further reinforce Mamdani's reflections, Tata Menta, in his book entitled Unmasking Social Science Imperialism, Globalization Theory as a Face of Academic colonialism, she argues that the contemporary social sciences remain a product of the capitalist world system. And Eurocentrism, which is constitutive of the Jew culture of the system, characterizes the parochiality of its universalism, assumptions about superiority of Western civilization and imposition as the sole theory of global progress. The creation of the structures of knowledge, specifically the institutionalization of the social sciences, is a phenomenon that is inextricably linked to the very formation and maturation of Europe's capitalist world system and imperialism. Thus, in the words of Enrique Dusser, the idea of enlightenment is in fact a European phenomenon, but one that constituted in the dialectical relations with the non-European other. That is its ultimate content and enlightenment, also modernity, occurs when Europe affirms itself as the center of the world history, that it inaugurates the periphery that surrounds the center becomes now constantly the part of its self-definition, which simply goes back to the initial concept of the invidious position as used by Sabel Rolfe, that we become part of the Europe self-definition, while at the same time we become excluded as the periphery of the same center. So there wouldn't in any case be Europe as the center without us. So that kind of a model of a binary of thinking, center periphery, becomes the dilemma of the system itself. Um, as I proceed, this idea creeped out of the historical processes of Western colonial and economic dominance and has in turn provided the ideological justification for such a dominance. And it's important to also state that uh, this supremacist idea 
um, justified the European voyagers of discovery beginning in the late 14th century that opened the path for mercantilism, slave trade, imperialism, colonialism. Now we talk of neo-colonialism. These processes were articulated from their point of view as entailing the spread of civilization, the spread of modernity, the spread of commerce, and more in particular, the spread of Christianity to those places like Africa, which were viewed as uncivilized and populated by human-like subjects or savages. Hegel, as I have already stated much more earlier, um, proves his ignorance when he announces through his college that Africa has no history, no culture, and is a place populated by barbaric and subhuman beings. It is therefore important, brothers and sisters, that we should be clearly reflective of the very content of the things that we are teaching. And for that reason, Emmanuel Wallenstein, who is one of the important scholars who postulated the world system theory, he argues that the social sciences have been Eurocentric throughout their institutional history, which means ever since there have been departments teaching social sciences within the university systems. Emmanuel argues that they are products of the modern world system and Eurocentrism is constitutive of the geoculture of this modern world. Thus, social sciences emerged in response to the European problems at the point in history when Europe dominated the whole world systems. And as a result of that, the choice of subject matter theorization, methodology, and epistemology all reflected the constraints of the context which produced them. Thus, what we have in most field of study, within social sciences in particular, is the Eurocentric indoctrination which marginalizes African ways of knowing and often full of patronizing views and stereotypes regarding the continent. I will now shift to using development studies as my field of study um, as a case in point for the sake of time so that I also try to cover almost all the points. Development studies as a field of study which emerged around the 1950s, just after 1945, post the Second World War. Um, postures the notion of development as a linear process from Europe to Africa, claiming that the continent needs to be redeemed from its backwardness when actually the same people who are claiming to be bringing development and defining development for Africa are actually the ones who looted the continent as evident through the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. This conference that happened in Berlin, I would describe it as a terrorist conference which led to the physical partitioning of the continent and extraction of the mineral resources without any regard for the African families. If you ask me the question, what happened to the bread of the African children? My friend, I will point you to the Berlin Conference and its ruthlessness. The poverty that you see in Africa today, it is a constructed reality. It does not come from heaven above. It is a created condition. 
The aftermath of this conference led to the enslavement of Africans in their own continent. Just as we have a scenario here in the southern tip of Africa, where the occupants of the land became garden boys and domestic workers of the same people who stole from them. How holy is that? Like the hyenas launching on their prey, they ripped apart the continent for their own selfish pursuits. Now, what becomes important about development studies is that the watershed moment in the emergence of the modern day development discourse is the inaugural speech of Harry Truman, one of the presidents of America in 1949. This is the birthplace of development. Program point four, 1949. Harry Truman announces, we must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of the underdeveloped areas. More than half the people of the world are living on the neo-colonial mission to implement their straight-jacket modernist development paradigm to conceal what they have been doing since the early 1500s. Therefore, my argument is that the project of development itself was the continuation of the same project of modernity. It has just changed the face but it was still the same project, which is as work. Sabelon Zovukacheni in his article entitled, Coloniality of Power in Development Studies and the Impact of Global Imperial Designs on Africa, argues that the colonial idea of development meant the following, the dispossession of Africans, and forcing them off the land and converting them into peasant workers and domestic servants of the white settlers. Rearrangements of African agrarian systems to make sure that they produce the cash crops that are needed in Europe. Designation of land as a private property of white settlers in those areas that fell victim to settler colonialism. Indeed, in the words of Daniel Lerner, in his book entitled, The Passing of Traditional Society, Modernizing the Middle East, he writes, the only hope for the non-European nations is to be modernized by an injection of the Western values and expertise. He further states that the dissemination of Western values and ideas through Western mass media could help transform countries of the Middle East from traditional and primitive nations into countries with modern forms of social, economic, and political organizations. And against this background, it becomes necessary to ask the following question. How does the global South, and in particular Africans, make themselves the subjects of development rather than its objects? In responding to this critical question, which informs the basis of my submission in this presentation, it is imperative to historicize the African development predicament resulting from a history of European colonization of Africa and the resultant effect of coloniality as a manifestation of a neo-colonial order. It is therefore significant as a way out of this impasse, intellectual and knowledge cul-de-sac 
that are making a call. As it is made by Sabelon Rovukajeni and other decolonial scholars, as it is made by the father of Afrocentricity, Malefikete Asante, that we need to reground, we need to reroot Africa within its own history, culture, and assert its agency. Thus, knowledge on development must be delinked from Eurocentric oppressive cosmology and be located within the Afrocentric paradigm. Nothing for us without us. And indeed, if it is for us, we have a right to say a word and to define what it means. No longer can knowledge on development be merely interpreted within the experiences of those who have abused and robbed others, as it is the perpetuation of the colonial logic. It becomes necessary to shift the very locus of enunciation to enable contextual relevance, in particular, to ensure that the voices of those who have been deprived become prioritized. I therefore want to come to the last section of my presentation into which against all that I've said about Europe and its evil in history, what is our way forward as scholars? What fundamentally am I proposing in order to escape this enmeshment, this entry, this, this messy entrapment. How do we move out of it? I want to propose Afrocentricity, Afrocentering, as the name denotes, as a relevant African-centered decolonial paradigm for the decolonization of social sciences and development studies, in particular in India. Those who are my Indian counterparts, I do believe that within their own locality, they can be able to use their own knowledge systems and we will be able in this process of creating ties, cooperatives, collaborations, as we are all under the entrapment of Euro modernity as a bundle, that we also learn to speak with our own voices. When I propose Afrocentricity, I am not seeking to speak of an exclusionist, fundamentalist paradigm. All I'm saying is to be for ourselves is not necessarily to be against others. We are byproducts of environments and that environment has enabled us to have different knowledge systems. So in most of the cases, the perceptions tends to be when you talk about African centeredness, you are on the road to exclusionist mission as Europeans did. And I need to also clarify one of the mythology. We do not have a problem with Eurocentrism as it relates specifically to Europeans, but we have a problem when it crosses the border to become our worldview. If my mother already gave me a name, Sir Richard III from certain spaces and geography section takes a power to redefine me. He's actually usurping power. He's undermining the foundation that has already been laid. And this is fundamentally the problem of hegemonic cosmology with Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism is relevant as a narrative for Europeans, but it cannot be pushed down our throat as our own reality. I'm therefore suggesting that Afrocentricity is relevant for Africans themselves. And we therefore need to become our own agents. If we don't learn to speak with our own mouths, we don't use our own mythology, 
we become trapped in other people's realities that has nothing to do with us. By a way of historicizing the concept of, of Afrocentricity, it will become important, firstly, for scholarly contribution to acknowledge those who have led before me. The idea of Afrocentricity as a pan-African paradigm is a creation of Professor Mulife Gete Asante, a professor and the chair of agroecology at Temple University, along with the Temple Cycle of Scholars, such as Professor Ama Mazama, Dr. Tsafogeto, who is now late, born and bred here in South Africa, uh, Professor Abu Berry, Professor Theophile Obenga, Terry Kesho, and many others. And I do believe that uh, as the future proceeds, uh, my name will definitely appear in this work. <laughs> anyway, um, according to Professor Asante, Afrocentricity is a paradigmatic intellectual perspective that privileges African agency within the context of the African history, culture, and agency transcontinentally and transgenerationally. And I think what I need to clarify, because I think there have been a lot of confusions that were created by many scholars to confuse Afrocentricity with Afrocentrism and also with Africanity. And it is always very important to become clinical with the concepts when used so that we do not create uh, an ideological hodgepodge. And for those who also be the students in social sciences, conceptual clarification is very important that when you take a particular scholar, uh, invest in studying the work of that scholar and do not twist the words of the scholar and impute or impose in them something else that they did not say. Afrocentrism, it's a movement that and that becomes the incorrect paradigm to understanding Afrocentricity. Now, Africanity as a combative method. Uh, a methodology emerges mostly out of the Negritude movement, which included Leon Damas, uh, which also included Amos uh, and Leopold Songo, uh, who were the, the students of art in France. And but mostly in South Africa, it was advanced by Archibald Mafeche, who's one of the renowned uh, anthropologists. Africanity deals with the ontology, the being African. And, and so the critical argument in Afrocentricity is that ontology and perspective are not necessarily one. Just because one is an African by being does not necessarily imply that mental orientation is African which is bodily, you may be of an African descent by birth, but so psychologically on account of dislocation, be located in Europe. That's why we have many African people whose minds are trapped in the West, although the body has remained in Africa. That is a byproduct of the ritual of uh, militaristic practice that was created whenever they found the African warriors and they killed them. If you look in the book by Ngugi Wathiong, Something New and Something Tall, he starts with a very interesting story about when the British soldiers captured one of the Kosaki called Hinza. What they did, because it was problematic to the British forces, they cut off his herd. And this is the practice and the ritual that they've been doing even in other areas where they were killing the negatives. Then they took the herd, leaving the body in Africa. They went with the herd to England. 
at a spiritual level or metaphysical reality, what it meant was that while the body remained in Africa, the head, the brain will be in England. For that reason, to be African bodily does not automatically mean naturally that the thinking is African. You might find that the mind has been transplanted. This is exactly what colonial education has actually done. It takes Africans and locates their minds to study in the place which is not that of their own origins. So I was simply just trying to provide conceptual clarity around those uh, concepts. So within Afrocentricity, um, the quality of location is essential to any analysis that involves African culture and behavior, whether literally, or economic, whether political or cultural. In this regard, Afrocentricity is the crystallization of the critical perspective on facts. In addition to the above definition, Asante re-emphasizes that Afrocentricity is a mode of thought and action in which the centrality of African interest, values, and perspective predominate within the African narrative. Nobody should tell our own stories at our own expense. The broader objective of Afrocentricity, as I draw towards the closure, is to deal with the question of African identity from the perspective of African people as centered, as located, as orientated, as grounded within their history and within their own culture. African people from the viewpoint of Afrocentricity should be relocated mentally, historically, economically, socially, politically, and philosophically. In this way, they will overcome the syndrome of merely viewing themselves as the footnote in the script of European history or the objects of European experimentation waiting to be developed. One of the biggest crises that I've seen among the so-called philosophers, most of them in their numbers, once they start articulating on philosophy, I can tell you, they're going to quote Socrates, they're going to quote Plato, they're going to quote all these names. But the crisis that we're actually having is that it is as though philosophy began with them. But the funny issue is that if you take the early Greeks, they gave acknowledgement to the ancient Kemetians themselves. If you take one of the modern fathers of Greek philosophy, Thales, speaking to the young Pythagoras, the young Pythagoras, after whom Pythagoras theorem was named, asked a question to his elder in knowledge. And he says to Thales, how shall I become great? Thales responses, you shall do as I did, which is, you shall go down to the land of Kemet and learn as I did. The early Egyptians, the early uh, Greeks did not have a problem of giving acknowledgement to the Kemetians. But the problem that we have is that the Europeans who hijack the agenda of Greece, they use it for self pursuit. Thales himself, or Thales. It is stated that when he had become of age, he moved from Kemet and moved back to the place of his origin, which is the city of Militas where he began to teach until he died. So there was a clear line of connection between the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks. So we need to therefore be careful that when we deal with the falsity of European foundation, 
that we are able to dis disentangle this whole aspect. I therefore want to argue as I close that the old African idiom states that if something is lost, first we look for it at home. To resolve the problem of relocation or dislocation, I want to make an argument to my fellow Africans that there is no place better than home. There's no better meal than the home cooked meal. I'm inviting African students to say, let us return back home. Let us throw back our minds and find a place on which we can stand. That is how we can deal with psychological madness and insanity that emanates out of Eurocentrism. For this reason, Asante asserts that to say that we Africans are dissented means essentially that we have lost our own cultural footing and have become other than our cultural and political origin, dislocated and disorientated. We are essentially insane. That is living the obscenity from which we will never be able to free our minds until we return back to the source. Afrocentricity as a theory of change intends to relocate the African person as a subject. And as a Pan-African idea, Afrocentricity becomes the key to the proper education of children and the essence of an African cultural revivification or renaissance, and indeed for the survival of Africans. Afrocentricity as an intellectual point is therefore similar to what ancient Egyptians called a jet, or what the ancient Greeks called a stasis, which is a foundation on which to build the indestructible society. This is the image of a jet. A jet is a foundation which was used in order to build the indestructible structures, which was used by the early commissions. Now, Afrocentricity becomes a hiding place against the rainy storms. If you don't know who you are, if you do not have any foundation on which you stand, you become solid by those who know who they are and where they are sending. So I was simply just using this image uh, as a portrayal of what a jet is. So that is what Afrocentricity is as an intellectual uh, level. Afrocentricity as an expression of centrism, therefore, is groundedness that allows the student of human culture investigating African phenomena to view the world from the standpoint of Africans, which is from the jet of Africans. The mayor dilemma and arrogance, therefore, characterizing Eurocentric scholarship has been to express the unwillingness to learn from others as this poses a threat to their hegemony. Thus, Eurocentrism has plunged into epistemic racist posture, which has led to self-praise and egoistic plague that has denied Africans the platforms to speak. As I conclude with these remarks, until we as Africans reset the social sciences, the humanities, the natural sciences, and the arts more closely to our own historical narratives, we will continue to assume the role of a junior brother and sister to other world narrative as if our own experiences, that is, those of our ancestors are less important than others. For this reason, Afrocentricity, as I argue, can have a significant influence in the manner in which African researchers view their identity and interpret their reality from a centered position to overcome the disorientation and dissentedness created by Eurocentric perspective. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, Lessa. Uh, whenever we, we, we study or teach African literature, 
my opinion or my feeling is it's my own literature that i'm teaching i feel very closely related to african literature be it uh, right from the time of uh, chinua achibi yes. or nugugi uh, when we teach i i generally teach african literature to my ms students so uh, i feel very closely uh, in close it it appears that i am teaching my own literature so that is that's the kind of emotion and that's the kind of uh, opinion strong opinion that i possess uh, because yes. i feel i feel uh, that uh, the african writers have very bluntly and and very rationally and very clearly have uh, you know been able to portray their sufferings through their writings that is the credit yeah. that the african writers uh, african writers have which i feel uh, in indian literature our writers there are few names but our writers have not been able to do that they, in my opinion is completely my personal opinion most of the indian writers have very slightly presented the writings of india and that is what makes the difference between an indian writer and an african writer an african writer wrote something which was very true to his or her land wrote something which was very close to his or her, her heart and presented it before the world which gave and we all know the history of chinua achibi how he struggled to get a yes. publisher for his first novel and uh, that breakthrough in getting that publisher Uh, i i would uh, i would uh, rather say uh, was the breakthrough was the bridge that helped the african writers uh, you know express their opinions and reach the writers of the world so uh, in my opinion i generally have debates and discussions with my scholars and my colleagues who are working in african literature and i generally tend to ask this question to them that don't you think that the african writers are very blunt very clear very rational and very straight to the point uh, be it chinua achibi or i i consider the carbon copy of chinua achibi as adichi now writing so uh, you know uh, you will find adichi is as strong as chinua achibi so i consider her to be a really carbon copy be it her ted talks that i watch be it her videos that i watch be it her interviews that i watch so uh, i hope i will get an opportunity to some day interact with adichi also and uh, you know uh, that It's is going to happen amen amen <laughs> <laughs> so, that is something which i feel is lacking in most of the indian writers the indian writers in english literature especially have not addressed that clearly the pathos of colonialism of course there are writers you will consider uh, some some of the partition writers but overall african writers are in this particular forte is is my opinion they are, they are doing uh, great work for the last 50 60 years so uh, lesa it's is that kind of emotion that i have when i talk to an african writer when i read something about african writing Uh, i don't know i have never been to any african country i did not have the privilege and opportunity but i feel that they are very close to me and they write what i feel so thank you very and i must much. say that uh, i must say that as you speak you are glowing with joy i can i can see the effect on your face <laughs> i'm very happy actually i am very happy whatever you are speaking today about eurocentricism and decolonization and hegemony i do that in the class and my some of my students are of opinion that sometimes i become very emotional <laughs> and uh, this is the reason why because you know i completely i completely am in favor of decolonization in I, fact the the critical important issue here has been a misunderstanding that uh, the fact of expressing that level of passion when we talk it has led to others within the global south to think that we see to pursue an exclusionist perspective the reality is that the enemy is one and the the same enemy has lied in different areas and has benefited from us all 
So I'm not necessarily advancing the world view in which only Africans exist. In fact, um, Afrocentricity advances multiculturalism, but not multiculturalism, which is promoted by Eurocentrism Absolutely. as the epicenter. Absolutely. In fact, um, Asante pushes the agenda of uh, polycentrism to say that there are multiplicities of centers, but these centers have to find a way of cooperating. In fact, if you look at the work of Walter Rodney in how Europe underdeveloped uh, Africa, he's able to narrate in that source, which is dated since 1972, he's able to narrate very clearly in the early 1500s that African people have been trading with all others until we were befell by trickery. So I am not an African exclusionist who wants to fall in the same idea of projecting that when I speak of African centering, I'm excluding others within the global South. Otherwise, divided we, we, we fall, but we can each, while standing on our own understanding, find ways as part of the human race of exchanges and of growing together to fight. In fact, the conference of 1959 uh, of the Bandung was the highest moment that showed the collaboration uh, uh, between Africa and Asia, as we all sought independence from the entrapment of the capitalist kind of a development. So I'm, I'm very glad to, to hear your thoughts, my brother. Uh, thank you, Lesa. Uh, now, I, as, as is the emphasis on this particular uh, Northeast Lecture Series, uh, we emphasize more on observations and questions. So you can have your cola in the meantime while answering the questions, Lesa. I know you are thirsty. You have spoken for more than an hour, nonstop. Yeah. Yeah, I, we understand. Yeah. We are also a tropical country, so we understand. <laughs> and, so, yeah. Uh, uh, the first question, Lessa, uh, is uh, from uh, Dr. Amod Kumar Rai from a state in our country called Uttar Pradesh. His question is, uh, now Eurocentricism has been dead quite long. What attempt academicians and university departments are doing towards the making of Africanism? means towards rewriting history, reshaping theoretical orientation, and encompassing indigenous disciplines? In fact, uh, I would want to approach it by saying that there was never a dull moment from our very encounter with Europeans where Africans were silent. The very anti-colonial struggles manifested that Africans could not be able to tolerate domination. Now, shifting more into academia, I will use an example that in terms of the present day efforts, in South Africa, we have seen in the past two years, young people marching around the country, demanding the free and the decolonized education. It was very interesting for me that students themselves realized that something was wrong with education. We are also beginning to witness growth even as we speak right now, in terms of the movement of uh, Africanization, decolonization of the curriculum, decolonizing epistemology, this is a subject and a theme that has been there since the aftermath of political decolonization in the 1950s. One of the sad scenarios is the fact that 
most of the uh, scholars who are pushing decolonization sometimes become mitigated, they become belittled, um, economic resources are used to try to shut them down, to push them out of the system, but we continue with that fight. The kind of the work that I'm doing today, which is actually lessons from other scholars who have been there. For example, Mulefia Sante has been doing this work since the early 70s. Uh, even if you look into dependency school of thought in Latin America, um, they have been pushing this whole work. You look at the works of the post development scholars like Churo Escobar, they have been pushing that there is a problem with knowledge. So, but in the context of Africa, indeed, since the aftermath of independence, you have spoken about Chinua Achebe. They have done some of the greatest work. Uh, indeed, we have spoken and looked at the work of people such as Sheikh Anta Diop. What simply needs to happen within our current uh, disciplines is to ensure that it becomes the responsibility of each and every scholar to change the, the course contents and to recenter the local voices. And I know that I have a responsibility in terms of my own department that uh, I need to factor in African writers. And what I'm therefore suggesting is not to simply do cut and paste. Uh, you know, while allowing Eurocentrism to become the over voice and then attaching some few African scholars, there has to be the complete overhaul of the study material. So in a way, uh, my response would be that uh, we are right in a correct platform and the movement has started in which we are reclaiming ourselves. At the university where I work, I'm glad that my colleague, uh, uh, Richard Plagg is there, can actually attest. It's no longer been business as usual. We have seen the emergence of young scholars who are disrupting uh, the system by asking critical questions. So the work is underway. We have seen students in the University of Cape Town bringing down the statue of Cecil John Rhodes. And uh, we have seen it in Verts, we have seen it in UKZN, that indeed there is a radical work that is actually taking shape where Africans are beginning to reclaim themselves. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, my second question comes from a research scholar, uh, Vishwajit Mandal. His question is, Colonialism created a cultural trauma that still we are carrying with us. Can you please mention few ways through which the cultural trauma is reflecting in present day? Look, um, one of the critical issues, I prefer to focus on language as a expression of culture. The whole issue of naming uh, as a reflection of culture, because language is a communicator and a carrier of culture. The fact that we have to speak our problems and expressing them in a language also foreign to us. It's one of the manifestation of how coloniality is basically at work. Um, so in a way, it would appear that if you bear the names of Western ancestors, Western people, you are found to be much more relevant. The whole culture of the naming of the buildings according to the people who have actually conquered those areas. I was, for example, in an area where I stay in South Africa, 
of Atridgeville, talking about how the name Atridge speaks to the European woman who was seen as a fighter of the African people. But in that area, there's no white person who actually stays. So it simply suggests that African people become insignificant. So in every city, in every town, so the naming is actually one of the issues. One of the other challenges, which is an expression of culture, has to do with religion itself, the religious culture itself. We have seen how Christianity um, and how it has actually been used to demonize the mythological perspectives of African people. And, uh, you know, it, it's one way in which we can actually be able to see how the destabilization of Africans and their culture, which is their custom and their way uh, of doing and of thinking has actually been affected. So these are but just uh, some of the few, few expressions in which I see how the perpetuation of our entrapment in the West. But at least there's much of a change that I'm beginning to see where parents are no longer even giving English names to their own children. They are actually retaking power in terms of uh, understanding that there was nothing wrong with us naming our own kids. So the issue of naming and the issue of language for me and the fact that in language there is a meaning of life that connects to the environment within which people live becomes something that is much more a critical. But I'm not denying the fact that uh, the culture of capitalism as a network continue to discipline us and to turn us merely into the caricature. I still also believe that it's not enough merely to deal with issues of culture, through language, but we also have to find a way in which we reground ourselves to attack and challenge the issue of economics itself, so that we do not deal with culture as something that is in the remote. So maybe that would be my thinking. Yeah, so pertaining to your uh, uh, Christianity part, uh, especially I would say the missionary, the role of the missionaries, uh, which yes. has been time and time again questioned by the various African writers. And uh, it has been you know, written in the form of poems, in the form of novels also. So pertaining to that issue, Lesa, I have a question from, okay. uh, from Sindhu Thomas. Now, Sindhu Thomas is asking, how is it possible to solve the issues resulting by the influence of Christianity during colonization? This is one. And the other is, same thing, uh, it's an attached question. Does decolonization and Afrocentricity involve undoing Christianity as well? Um, I think it's a, it's a critical question because I know that issues of beliefs are important. I come from a Protestant evangelical tradition as a Baptist. <laughs> so hermeneutically, I was a preacher and I know that uh, when you touch Africa, you become demonized. And I was kicked out of many churches <clears throat> that I'm politicizing the church. But what we need to understand, which is fundamentally important, is that colonization fundamentally is spiritual. In 2016, with a group of scholars from UNISA, we went to Barcelona in Spain to attend the decolonial summer school led by Ramon Cross Fugel. I had a privilege with Dr. Lua Zilushaba, who is based in Cape Town, politics department. As we walked down the Rambla Street, we stopped at the statue of Christopher Columbus. The horror I saw was very scary. Beneath that statue were the images of the angelic beings, which were ushering Columbus as a messenger of God to the Americas. Lucky enough, last year I was in Philadelphia, uh, Harbor Street. When I got to Harbor Street, I was led to the understanding that this is where Columbus was pointing to uh, from Barcelona. So when I got there, 
I saw the big monuments there that welcomed Columbus. He is called the messenger of God, the charismatic leader and all of that. I want to throw you to two documents in dealing with Christianity. One will be the Papal Award. I want scholars to go and read about it. It is also called the Bull Decree, created in 1493 under the leadership of Pope Alexander VI, the father of Caesar Borgia, AKA Yeshua. Uh, Caesar Borgia in order, if you read the preambles of those documents, uh, Pope Alexander VI clearly states that the, by the power vested to art by God through the blessings that was granted in Apostle Peter, we have the power to go, to colonize, to Christianize any of the savages that we found in the, in the, in the new world. The issue of the Christ and the world from an African perspective embodied with white imaginaries, images, becomes a problem that if I'm created in the image of God and then I'm given the picture of Jesus whose pigmentography does not look like mine, automatically it becomes a hegemonic cosmology. But what we are not questioning are the values that underlie Christianity about love your neighbor as you love yourself. What we are dealing with maybe precisely is the kingdom theology that is itself rooted within the Nicene Council of the 13th century through the voting of the hand that created the narrative of a theology upon which Roman Catholicism established itself. So maybe the simple point that I'm coming to is that uh, uh, Christianity, we have had black theological scholars who have taken the direction of black liberational theology to use the same biblical text to correct the problem of racism. In fact, there are a document I want to refer the scholars to read to show the problem with religion. It's uh, the political speech of King Leopold II in 1883, he had a meeting with the Roman Catholic missionaries and he was preparing them for the colonization of Congo. And he says that be Satan that the people you are going to already know God, but you're going there to protect the Belgian interest. So all I'm simply saying is that Christianity as a force can be used in pursuit of political conquest. But we are not rejecting the existence of God, but we are saying the agents that narrate God, if they mix their agency with colonizing others' perspectives, it becomes a problem. Maybe I will end at that. Thank you, Lesa. Uh, Professor Sushmita Talukdar from Nepal, her question is, as academicians, what would you suggest of multicultural disciplinary action? Can we come out of institutionalized education of providing knowledge just by opening several segmented disciplines in a university, for example, African studies or Asian studies? You know, that's a very important question. One of the biggest problems that we have is that uh, the idea of a university itself creates the problem of uh, monopoly. It is for this reason that decolonial scholars speak of pluriversity, not university. In fact, we have another crisis of disciplinarity. The functions of the disciplines is to discipline. <laughs> so that's why we have then pursued 
transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity. Uh, you know, that emanated from the fact that there are many common issues. It's like, for example, I come from development studies as a department, and it's called a discipline. Now, development lends its theories from sociology, and so is political science. But all these things are the constructs of modernization theory rooted in the Western paradigm. So my challenge is that, yes, it is possible, uh, as we are doing at this moment, we have debunked the order of uh, university traditions. We have found a way as decolonial scholars to create our own networks and enrich ourselves. My change in particular, did not come from my department or from the discipline. It came from the conversations that we had with other scholars as we were having coffee. And I realized that I was lost. And then I took these reflections, I took them back to the department to challenge the department itself. I'm glad that I can see one of my fellow traveler, Dr. Bongani Mkonza. Uh, I'm excited just to, to see him. So in a way, it is therefore very critical for me to say that uh, the culture of a university, in fact, the decolonial scholars are the liberators themselves, but first they must liberate themselves. They must liberate themselves from the discipline. Uh, and then in that way, we recreate a complete different culture of engagement. So it is highly possible, but I think uh, we would have to work through the college structures in the within the college of human sciences in unisa right now we have what we call the transformation charter which has now become binding to the rest of other departments to become the overarching document for us to change our subject so we can work within these structures while disobeying the same structures so that is what we, we would call a epistemic disobedience. <laughs> so we sometimes have a contradiction of what we can call a obedient disobedience. So yes, it does have its own contradictions, but we, we create liberations while we work to some degree within the same structures while we also seek to change them. So it is highly possible. What I'm doing at the moment is that uh, I'm epistemically disobedient to the order that has been while operating from the office space of a university. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a next question from Archie Ford Metwa from uh, Zimbabwe. His question is, uh, my argument is that in as much as we want to write our own narrative in our own way, we suffer challenges in publishing such narratives as the widely available publishing are exclusively for churning our Eurocentric publications. How are we or have we solved this challenge? In fact, that is the most reliable question. I remember when we had the decolonial summer schools, one of the biggest issues was that uh, if you critique Marxism, will you be published in the journals that advances Marxism? The answer is no. You see, all these journals, they exist like empires that serve a particular issue to obey the logic of capitalism. Because we know that once a scholar publishes in accredited journals, it also has certain monetary values, <laughs> promotion opportunities. Um, my challenge would be that uh, we have seen the emergence of many uh, journals such as the Journal of the Black Studies, 
Journal of African Studies, Journal of African Renaissance. All these journals seek to create an avenue into which the work of decolonial scholars can be promoted. I think we're going to have to face a challenge as modern day scholars to say, we have an opportunity to create our own journals to be able to advance our own ideas. But we also need to bear in mind that we are in the middle of a warfare. Uh, just because they are creating obstructions and blockages, it does not imply that we have to be obedient and sell our souls to the devil for the sake of being published. In fact, if you look at Cheka under the old person, amazing example, he has been ostracized. He has been demonized. But it's on the basis of his work that today we are able to stand tall. So my challenge will be, let us not be afraid to suffer because of the change we want. Maybe not in our lifetime. Those who come after us will pick up where we left the sword and they will lift up the spear. So we should not be discouraged with that. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Sebeka Plaji from uh, University of South Africa. The question is, is Africanity, if, if Africanity is a combative ontology as suggested by Mahji and a combative hermeneutics suggested by Sene, is the modern university the right place to recenter and liberate African epistemology? Maybe, uh, my dearest brother, we, whom I had a conversation with this morning, uh, it's a brilliant question, but I'm going to challenge you uh, on the question of what fundamentally is a university. In most cases, sometimes we fall in a trap of looking at the university as a building and a structure. Uh, I would like to take an approach of yes, there is a building, but yes, we do have human minds that have been saved from those buildings. So uh, my issue would then be uh, from the physical locations called a university uh, with an African knowledge we can use those buildings to effect change. What fundamentally a university is asking for, it's asking for our minds to clone them. Once you have changed the content of the educators who occupy those buildings, the students who will be administered to by a scholar who operates from that office, from that lecture hall, uh, you can be able to bring about a change. So for me, yes, in Mafeche's narrative of Kennedy as a combative ontology, um, it, it is important that we are using the narrative of Mafeche in insisting that Africans must think and do things for themselves. To say, now that we have newly found the decolonial love, we will use our positions no longer as agents of modernity, but as the agents of transformative liberatory scholarship operating from what usually used to be the places from which Eurocentrism was taught. Therefore, the idea of a modern university should be debunked by African scholars who have now found hope in decolonization to instill a different agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Lesa. Uh, the next question is, from uh, Mr. Tapeshwar Prasad from St. Xavier's College uh, in India, in Patna, a place in uh, a state in a uh, state called Bihar in India. His question is, how could we debunk the myth that the spread of Christianity in Africa 
India and South Asian and non-European countries claiming that Christ being white skin still holds superiority over the tanned skin gods and goddesses of our less developed countries. Um, the starting point of the question is very problematic. It would seem the person who's asking the question wants me to say, first of all, that truth is a myth. It is not a myth. What I know is that white men from the West brought Christianity in Africa and undressed African people from their traditional clothing and gave them the suits to wear as a sign of being liberated from their backwardness. Uh, the question for me would then be, uh, Christianity itself must redeem itself uh, in a sense that if it becomes used as an element that invites others to a point of conversion, but it cannot be converted itself into other perspective. Then epistemically, it becomes a movement of colonization of the terms of reference because the foundation of Christianity is that it starts with, if only if you believe, and then it introduces a particular Messiah as a point of conversion. So I'm saying we must deal with the political context within which Christianity advances its theology. But if you go to the pre scene narrative of Christianity, which would now be called paganism, the biggest crisis with that, we are dealing only with two versions of Christianity, Roman Catholicism and Protestant evangelicalism, which are competing movements which emerge out of Europe, both of them, advancing to other parts of the world. It is as though other parts of the world did not have their own understanding of God. But what I would know from where I stand as an African is that white preachers indoctrinated African natives and taught them the belief through their own designed theological discourses and chapels. But at the same time, the same preachers were not allowing these African converts to stand in front of them and preach. Here in South Africa, the miracle that happened under apartheid was shocking. They used Calvinism in pursuit of political conquest. So the moment you say, God of Jacob, you are speaking about the person, God of Israelites, you are speaking to the specific nation. God of Israelites authorizes the Israelites to attack the Canaanites. Will the God of Canaanites respond? So I'm seeing the war of nations in which God is used in pursuit of hegemon. Where is God of humanity? The moment God becomes a private property of other people, we, we, we are going to have a problem right here. Well said. Uh, Dr. Rupali Jain from Delhi University, she is an assistant professor there. Her question is, in what ways do Western views of space differ from Africans' philosophy regarding space? Well, that is a... That is a very interesting um, question, which also relates to questions related to time. As I'm trying to think of John Inviti's work in philosophy, maybe the question would be by space, whether we are talking about physical, geography, we are talking space at a psychological level, depending on the angle from which that question 
uh, moves from, it will become very important. Uh, well, of course, our minds and our ideas travel to the very different corners of the earth. But physically, while our bodies are, are here. So I'm not sure if ever the person is asking the question by space, from which angle they are asking that, uh, perhaps I would not be able to best provide a clear answer, as the question itself was not clear. Dr. Sohan Pen from West Bengal, one of the states of India, eastern part of India. His question is, isn't it problematic to talk about a single African identity? Is Afrocentricity satisfactorily definable when Africa itself is so diverse? Um, I think that's a very fair question and uh, oftentimes it has been engaged with uh, Professor Mlifi Kete uh, Asante. I think maybe the question of African identity, um, it's quite a very broad question, um, which will then also then require that. Um, I can remember very vividly that within the context of the Pan-African Manifesto as a political project, the whole issue of the Africans in the diaspora and those within the continental borders was very uh, important. Of course, which then leads us to the critical question of how we define an African and then from who may not necessarily be an African. My view would be in Asante's response to that question, his argument was that the question of being distinctly African is not necessarily specifically related to someone emerging from a unique ethnic group, be it Zulu, Yoruba, and Debele, or so too. But it's a all-inclusive paradigm of thinking that seeks to deal with the questions of the people who descend from Africa as a continent itself. So in a way, Afrocentricity is not necessarily pushing a clique of the idea of ethnicity, but is dealing with a generalized view of a people who from the point of history can be, um, you know, properly traced as emerging from uh, African descendancy. So in a way, it is not distinctly focusing on a specific, uh, unique uh, kind of an ethnic group. So it, it's not necessarily uh, dealing with that. It's a much more of an all-inclusive paradigm. Hence, in my introduction, I used the pan-African, all African inclusive. But the other issue that is more important is how European scholars themselves have described uh, Africans. When we look at the Middle Passage, when Africans were being taken into slavery, not that they were slaves, when they were being taken into slavery, there was a sense of common awareness on the basis of their physiological orientation of sameness. It was not on the basis of their ethnic background, but they were seen as a same person in the eyes of the colonizer, which is why then much of the agenda in Pan-Africanism has been to try to be all inclusive. So therefore African Afrocentricity is not specifically pushing an agenda of a particular African ethnic group, but it seeks to offer a paradigm that is more inclusive. 
So maybe that, that if I'm correctly answering that. Have I covered all, all of the, I don't know if I did it. Uh, last three questions, Lessa. Uh, before asking this question, as Lessa uh, started his uh, presentation by thanking uh, Dr. Sai and Day, I would also, as the host of NOSIS lecture series, me on behalf of my entire team would like to thank Dr. Sai and Day. I hope uh, the participants know Dr. Sayande. He already was a research, uh, resource person for us a few days back. And he spoke wonderfully on depolarization. I would like to yes. thank him uh, because it is, it is because of Dr. Sayande that I could contact Lesa. And we are having such an engaging discussion today. So thank you, Dr. Sayan. And now coming back, uh, Lesa, to Sayan's question. Uh, first, he comments that a very thought-provoking uh, lecture, Lessa. After the lecture ends, it would be wonderful if you can share that the various philosophical perspectives that you are sharing, how, how they can be applied within our habitual learning and sharing experiences. Maybe it would be wonderful if you can share some instances from your daily life. Uh, you were saying if I can share some instances from my daily habitual learning and sharing experiences and he said yeah. that uh, it would be wonderful if you can share some instances from your daily life from my daily life yeah well um, that's a very interesting question that one um, look naturally on the basis of uh, one's passionate expressions. Um, I, I perhaps uh, believe that outside of a class, armed with a particular way of thinking in which we recognize that something is wrong in the world, my viewpoint would be a scholar of decolonization at an intellectual level. Practically, we have to be motivated to live in a way that the theories that we are able to express also change our attitudes and our relations uh, with others. Do you think Were you, were you, maybe maybe just to get it specifically, were you asking about my personal experiences in terms of my own daily living in relation to, to what I have presented? I, Is that what you... I, I repeat his question. Okay. It would be wonderful if you can share that the various philosophical perspectives that you are sharing, how they can be applied within our habitual learning and sharing experiences. This is his, his question. And he said that this question, if you can answer through your examples, through your daily life examples. I have a brother with me here who was also helping to interpret if you are uh, understanding you very well. Look, um, I may be right or wrong from the point of view of uh, uh, the person who's asking the question, that's if I truly uh, understood. Um, in my in my daily reflections. I do have uh, two of my colleagues there, uh, Mr. Blackie and Mr. Mukonza. Uh, much of what actually happened besides the everyday academic engagement within the university lecture times that we have created informal avenues in which we are able to disseminate various literature that we use to challenge certain ideas as we also seek to write some articles and to do some reflections in how best we can apply 
the the very theoretical lenses that we are that we are using. But besides that, uh, the other sense that I'm trying to get from the question, if I may expand it, is whether uh, preaching decolonization or teaching it has in any way an ability of molding and shaping the habits, the beliefs, and the lifestyle of a person. Maybe that's what I'm, I'm trying to deduce from there. Uh, my view would be in that case, um, who must be the practitioner of the ideas that you are preaching if it is not yourself? At a personal level, these ideas have enriched my own self-consciousness, relationship with others as we seek to reinculcate the new values of learning to think in a much more uh, different way. And indeed, uh, if theory does not help one to move into praxis, it becomes useless exercise on its own. So I, I, I maybe that's if I've, I've really answered that very well. I was not sure whether if I was um, indeed uh, no, he Understood. was asking that only. As for the chat box, he was asking that only. Sorry? He, you are absolutely right. You are spot on on answering the question. Uh, Cyan, uh, oh, okay, right. okay. That's so I think in a, in a, in a natural way, uh, I think uh, Brother Cyan Day will confess that uh, uh, my social media, in particular Facebook, it's, uh, it has become a lecture hall. Uh, I used to put the pictures of myself dancing there, wearing a red jacket, and I would get 500 likes. So I exchanged that for education, and I can I only get about five likes <laughs> because thinking it's a hard job, you know. So in a way, my own life, 24/7, um, has really changed in an amazing way. There are people such as Richard Plucky who can tell you, having been in the department for a long time, I was working in academia, but I was not really dedicated to reading. Maybe it's because uh, I was suffering from coloniality unaware and not knowing. But once the leaves of ignorance have fallen, you develop a burden. Once you have a burden, um, it challenges you. For the first time, you live a purposeful life. You wake up to the next day saying, what else can I do for my continent? What can I do for my people? So learning from the works of Professor Maulana Davisi Takarenga, who is at the University of California, Los Angeles, in his theory of Kawaida, he is teaching us that the liberatory scholar must also be a participant within his community and must bring a sense of an inspiration and must also become an example of his people. And for that reason, he was able to create the US Organization for Cultural Revival. Um, I do have a network of other fellow friends with whom beyond scholarly level, we have created very good communities in which the quality of our lives have improved. That's if I've really have been able to, to share. And the other thing that is more interesting, as a learning student of Professor Sante, uh, I was more interested the first time when I went to meet him, as an African child who has been bombarded by the images of the, the MTV, I thought I was going to meet a American superstar. When I got there, I met a servant of the people and he took me to various sites of the projects that he does with the high schools, where he's helping with his uh, knowledge to change their curriculum. But, uh, also how he assists 
the African migrants into Philadelphia to assist with the, their visas and travel documents. So in a way, I'm learning that beyond words, beyond class involvement, there is more of what I can be able to do. But I also, from time to time, get to commentate within the local radio stations on particular issues and to do my own reflections, which I may regard as my own part of community uh, contribution, but I wish I can actually do more. Thank you. Thank you. Now one question from your uh, colleague uh, Bongani, uh, who is with yes. us, with us uh, from your place, South Africa. Uh, do you have exceptional examples of Afrocentric based developments that are contemporary and futuristic? <laughs> um, that's a very interesting question. And I know Bongani very well, and I know what he's doing, but it's good. <laughs> um, we need to be very careful when a question will come and say, BMW is a German designed car. Go to Africa and design your own African car. We need to be very careful with that example. Uh, because what it invites you into is to say, here it's an African specific designed project, when actually the brains of Africans behind the facade of this German cars uh, become distorted. My own thinking, if I would uh, refer to Bongani, would be to try to lead him to the question of uh, culture as a framework, culture as a way of life. And I'm not sure also if uh, Mr. Bongani, by saying, give us one example that Africa has created, uh, he has sort of uh, uh, something that is tangible, that is material uh, in mind, such that it becomes an evidence of development. I would, uh, I would look at the motive of that question uh, and I would actually find something which is a, a, a problem effect in that kind of an approach. But the reality that I'm coming to is that uh, uh, what Africa has experienced has been a theft of history, theft of its own resources, theft of its own people, to create what today we would call a, 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 a European creation. So I, I think maybe that question for me would somehow put me into the corner in its invitation to say, yeah, it's a phone, maybe if that is the motive, it was created by Africa. But my, my, my landscape in terms of Afrocentric reflection would be, we would know very well in terms of civilizational uh, contributions of Africans. Uh, the attempt has been to exclude uh, the commercial civilization out of Africa, to try to label that part of the world as South Europe, so that uh, we become disconnected as Africans. When you have the pyramids that have been created by Africans, uh, European scholars will say they were created by extraterrestrial beings to hide the fact that uh, Africans have actually been making amazing creations. Today we can be able to look at, uh, you know, the kind of the technology that we are using today and the cell phones that we have. And then we would find that African people all over have actually created a certain kind of uh, of, uh, 
changes. Maybe my 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 simple point uh, uh, of what I'm simply saying is that uh, um, theft of history has created a serious problem into which uh, um, after Africans have actually advanced their technologies, they get stolen and then the colonizing master will say, show me what you have actually created when actually we are also used as a, a workforce. So my thinking would simply be that uh, there's so much that Africa has actually done that has shown to the world. And uh, the critical call that I'm simply just seeking to make, it's not that of questioning Africans' creative abilities, but it's that that simply seeks to highlight the predicament of Africans who have been the genius in their own creations, who now simply now exist as the slaves of modernity. I think evidence can actually uh, speak for itself. I wouldn't even want to talk about the great Zimbabwean walls. I wouldn't even want to talk about the Mapungubwe, the ornaments that have actually been created by Africans. I would not even want to talk about the fact that in historical records, the very first mining um, activities, which is uh, 45,000 years um, ago, it's found right here in the Mpumalanga uh, province. So what more must we show the world? What more must we give? We have even given our own very bodies. So the question of uh, exception, exception from what? Who is the measuring standard? Pongani can hear me very clearly where I'm coming from. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great, Lessa. Uh, your talk has finished. And so as our time, you have been very kind enough. Oh, you have not I will you have take, noticed that. I will, I, will, I will just take the last question. Uh, this is from Robert, Robert Gee from Philippines. Okay. His, his question is, what is the role of globalization in Afrocentricism? Globalization has been happening long before Eurocentrism. African people have been traveling the world and then much of history in particular, when you even look at the works of Ivan Satima, you will realize that his argument is that the African people who are in America are not only there because of African enslavement by the colonialists. In fact, he makes an argument that they came before Columbus. Before the present order, people have always been moving and traveling uh, around the world. Interesting enough, engaging much of the history of the movement of the African people. If you can look now at the works that are produced through the works of Ranuku Rashidi, as one of the amazing scholars, he's able to show ornaments, he's able to show patterns and styles of how how African people throughout the world have been traveling and have left their own imprints. So I'm trying here to separate the globalization which became the creation of European conquest and the globalization that is born from the fact that human beings on their own nature have been walking the planet and have been interacting until we were befell at a particular point in time in history, which is not so long, a period of 500 years of European uh, barbaric civilization, maybe to put it that way, which is a civilization that sought to exclude other people out of the earth and to make them slaves. So Afrocentricity, it is indeed a project that believes in uh, multiculturalism, because that's how the whole of the globe is. You cannot have a situation where you push others out of the space when actually Mother Nature has created us all. So in a way, Afrocentricity does not seek to become a totalizing voice. 
it does believe in the interaction with others, but we interact with others from the point of view of not necessarily having to neglect your identity, your history, and your culture. So in a way, um, globalization is a way of life, but not Euro-inspired global kind of a dread. But the movement of the people as a nature's way of expressing itself. So Afrocentricity, um, while it advances the liberation of Africans against modernity, but it is also not, uh, it is also inviting us into a move towards new humanity, not grounded on the evil that Europe has actually uh, created. So it is actually a call for re-examination of the question of the human. It's, a, it's more rehumanizing in its effort, while at the same time it's fighting Eurocentrism and European conquest and domination. But it invites us into the cause of rehumanization. So if globalization is about human encounters in the planet, facilitation of movement, creating the globe as a small place, a ball within which our lives can be enjoyed without any limitations, without any borders imposed for certain political pursuits by others, uh, then we do not have any problem. So Afrocentricity is anti-racist in its posture, uh, not so that it creates the African only world. Uh, so in a way, uh, I would look at the issue of globalization as movement interconnections among the people of the globe without necessarily having to lose our own identity as a place of beginning and the jet on which we stand on. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you so much, Lesa. Uh, it's, it's an absolute honor and pleasure uh, to, you know, you have been engaging this lecture nonstop for the last two hours, 10 minutes almost. And thank you so much. Uh, we did not have provision of so much time. You have been so kind enough to spare so much of time for us. Your cooperation is really very highly solicited because uh, you have all, always cooperated with me from the time I have contacted you. So thank you. You are a great gentleman. You are a great human being. And we will keep our association in the near future. That's for sure, comrade. And Definitely we shall we shall meet. And I just want to thank this gentleman yes. next to me here. Yes. Thank you He's so much. He's my great brother, Silo Maripane. Thank you. When brother. I was actually frustrated with my technological instrument, yes, yes. he actually hired a boardroom for me in a golf course here. So uh, kind, to say, so my kind friend, uh, come and, and be here and sit in a comfortable chair and speak to the world. That's so great. I, I feel good in it. That's great to see such kind of brotherhood that exists in your yeah. society as it exists in our society. So we have so many of commons among us that makes us uh, complete, you know, although geographically we are away from each other, but your culture and my culture is very similar in many ways. So I'm looking forward to cross the, I'm looking forward to cross the technological boundaries to come to your side. Definitely, definitely. definitely. You it, stay would be, it would be an honor to host you sometime in the near future. Definitely, we will look into that uh, uh, topic, uh, definitely. And on behalf of Team Gnosis, Lessa, it's a, and the participants, I'd just like to give you an idea. We had 272 participants joining us. And uh, we, we, we had around six countries uh, joining us. From six countries, we had joining us. And majority of the participants who have joined us are professors and associate professors in various universities and colleges. So I thank all the participants as well for taking out their valuable time and joining and you know making the most of this engaging lecture there are plethora of messages lesser i would uh, if i read it would uh, be next day mon tomorrow morning which is congratulating you for your marvelous presentation for your as as uh, evident from an african speaker very 
a bold, very to the point, very rational and very well read presentation. So congratulations. These are the messages from the participants. I'm just conveying it. Congratulations. Thank you so much on behalf of the entire team NOSIS and we will look forward. Thank you so much for having us. Just for the sake, uh, Lesa, I will be sharing with the next speaker slots with you. If you have time or if your colleagues or comrades have time, please ask them to join. Uh, our future sessions also and we have some more engaging speakers from around the world so thank you so much and please do associate with self with our general losses and one more thing lesa i would like to uh, mention that there are a few questions which uh, because of the paucity of time it could not be answered and i could not ask you uh, so what we have done is we are sending these questions we are emailing the questions to the speakers uh, the speakers can take out their valuable time and they can do it at their ease. They can type the answers and they can revert it back to us. And NOSIS is a quarterly general. So from the next issue onwards, what we will do is we will, towards the end of the general, we will be publishing four or five lectures, question answers. The, the answers that you type and revert to us, we will be publishing that and that will be available on the open domain also so that uh, people can read and you know we can add a kind of an archive in this dialogic process of decolonization so i will mail you the questions thank you so much lesa once again from team nosis thank you for joining and uh, uh, it is it is really a pleasure to have you and honor as well and thank you participants. my brother yeah thank you very much also from the rest of the team and i want to say brother Sayan day thank you very much for suggesting my name, my brother, I'm humbled with that. And um, it is through other news such as this that we are able to go back and to learn to read again and to learn to respond and to grow better. And thank you very much, Professor Sagan, uh, for your conversations. And, um, and I believe that uh, such a conversation will not stop from this day onward. Thank you very amen, much. Amen, amen, definitely. Thank right. you so much. Take good care, maintain social distance, and please be safe. Yeah. Greetings from India once I'll again. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much.